Wow. <laughs> okay. So uh, about nine months ago, uh, I was in the jungles of India uh, with about 16 other young students. And every morning for three weeks, we would wake up, we would crawl out of our tents, we'd pull on our leech socks, and we'd go trekking into the bush for hours and hours in search of insects. It was a field course in entomology, which is the study of insects. Um, and one of the main things we were graded on over the three weeks um, was the mini experiments we conducted. So basically, we had to go out into the bush, uh, find some cool insect-related phenomenon, tamper with it a little, uh, and then record our observations. So today, I'm going to tell you about one of the mini experiments I conducted, um, which turned out to be way cooler uh, and way more valuable as a story than I ever expected it to be. So these are weaver ants. They're called weaver ants because they build their nests out of leaves. Sometimes it's one leaf folded in half. Sometimes it's many leaves you know, pulled together. They form these long chains made of many small individual ants holding onto each other, and they pull the leaves together, and once they're touching, they sew them in place, fix them using silk produced by their larvae. Now, this is one weaver ant nest that we found just off the trail. That's the trail. Um, and you can see that it's just it's one big leaf that's been folded in half along the central stem, sort of like a taco on its side. Um, and one of the guys I was with, he saw this, and he immediately pulled out his knife, and he sliced through the silk threads that run along the left side between the two edges that were holding the leaf in place in half. And it immediately flopped open, and the ants went completely bananas, and we got to see their repair process. And it went something like this. Um, they formed those chains I was talking about. They started at the base of the leaf near the stem, and they slowly pulled the two edges together. And once they were touching, other ants were delegated just to holding things in place temporarily, sort of like stitches, one placed every centimeter or so. Um, here's a picture of them sort of halfway through the job. You can see they're moving from one end to the other, sort of like zipping, zipping something up. Um, and once the two edges were touching, other workers came out holding the larva in their mandibles. Now, the larva produced the silk, right? So they would sort of like dab the larva onto one side and then go around to the other side, drawing the silk between the two edges, going back and forth, back and forth, until the whole thing was sewn up. And it was really cool, and we were really excited, and we went home that night absolutely thrilled because we had seen these incredible little creatures problem-solving. Problem-solving. Problem solving, problem solving? The more, the more I said it, the less it seemed to fit, right? And the reason is that every single one of the behaviors I just showed you, forming chains, pulling things together, sewing it up, all of that is exactly the same things the ants would do when building the nest from scratch, right? It was a repeat. It wasn't, certainly wasn't a unique behavior, and that's what I wanted to see. But of course, if you want to see a unique behavior, you probably have to give them a unique problem. So I went back the next day, I borrowed that guy's knife, and I cut an irregular shaped hole in the top of their nest. This is about two and a half by one and a half inches. Um, and funnily enough, the first thing they tried is that same old strategy, form chains, pull it together, sew it up. Uh, except, of course, here that's not going to work, right? Uh, though they did try. They tried for like 40, 45 minutes, just her trying to get the two edges <laughs> together. Um, but of course, they didn't, and eventually the hole was empty, uh, and they gave up. So what happened next? All right. While all of this is going on, there are ants milling around the surface of the leaf, top and bottom. Many of those ants wander down the stem onto the main plant. And of those ants, three of them wandered onto the neighboring leaf where I had left the cutout piece. Um, now, the first ant walked up to the piece and, and sort of bit into it and just sort of started chewing it. Second walked over it and was just sort of screwing around. And the third one, walked right up to the leaf, sunk her mandibles into it, and immediately started tugging in the direction of the nest. Right? And after only a few seconds, the other two immediately started helping. And after a few more seconds, there was like five or six ants carrying this leaf piece back towards their nest. You can probably see where this is going. They fit it into the hole. They rotated it a few times, because remember, it's an irregular piece. It only fits in perfectly one way. And they patched it up. And yeah. And we can only imagine that workers went along the bottom with larvae in their mouths, sewing things in place. Um, so that's really cool. Um, but I'm not just telling you this story because it's a cool one. I'm also telling it to you because I think it's a really valuable one. There's a really neat lesson here about group problem solving, and I'd like to share it with you. Um, in humans, when it comes to group problem solving, um, we often think of people as belonging to one of two groups, I think. 
There are people who produce ideas, and there are people who implement ideas. People who produce ideas being sort of creative types, think outside the box, go wandering off from the nest, find an amazing solution, and drag it back. Uh, people who implement ideas, maybe they don't come up with the craziest stuff, but once an idea has been found, they work really hard, tirelessly, to put it in place, right? They're persistent, they're organized, they're efficient. They rotate the leaf a few times and then sew it up. And it's easy to see those two roles in the, in the story I've just told you. But the more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, the more I realized that there was a distinct third role being played here, uh, a role that was just as essential to this sweet solution um, as the other two. And those are the ants, the two ants, that saw what the third was doing when it started tugging away at that leaf and decided to help. Uh, the ants that seemed to recognize a good idea when they saw one. Let me show you what I'm talking about. When we get together, uh, and you know, when we sit down and we start trying to come up with solutions to a problem, the first thing we do, always, is come up with a bunch of ideas. A bunch of ideas of varying quality, right? Now, before we can pick one of those ideas, and start working to implement it, someone has to wade through that pile and sort the good from the bad. Someone has to be able to recognize the good ideas when they see them. Now, this is easy when the ideas are red and green light bulbs, but you know, they're, not, they're not always red and green light bulbs in the real world. Sometimes ideas are mixtures of good and bad. They're a bit more complicated than that. And so in this case, you know, we have to analyze each element of each idea try and predict how that element would perform in the future if it was part of our solution, and then try and judge whether that's good enough. And in doing so, construct an idea. Um, and this is the third role that I'm talking about, this middle step. Um, now, if you had to describe what attributes required to do well in this role, I don't think you'd call it creativity because you know, that's more needed on the left side. That's needed when you're producing ideas. And I don't think you'd call it just sheer work ethic either, because that's more needed over here when you're implementing idea, an idea. If I had to use one word to describe it, I think I'd call it judgment. Because it takes judgment to look at something in the moment and try and predict how well it would work out in the future. Right? Like cards against humanity. Sometimes you look at a card and you think this is brilliant, and you, you play it, and it, it's not. Right? <laughs> It's not always super easy. Um, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the sort of judgment you'd find in a cold courtroom, right? Not, not condemning heavy judiciary judgment. <laughs> More so the judgment you would find in a really wise leader or a smart investor. My favorite example of this kind of thinking is grocery store checkout lines. Because this is a situation in which we all use judgment, right? It's rush hour at Loblaws, which line do you choose? Um, now, I think everyone looks at how long each line is, um, and I think most of us will also look at how many items each person has within the lines. But you can go a lot deeper into the judgment of grocery store checkout queues. You know, for example, you could look at the types of items people have, because it takes longer to check out produce than it does a bag of chips, right? Because the clerk has to weigh it, and then type in the code, and down, and then weigh it, and oh, it's rolling away, weigh it, type in the code. And that takes extra time. And you can go a step deeper than that, even. And you can say, well, what kind of produce do they have? Because if it's something rare or seasonal, you know, like Jerusalem artichokes, the checkout clerk isn't going to remember that, right? And they're going to have to pull out their little booklet and, and find the code, or they're going to ask their friend, Janet, what's the code for Jerusalem artichokes? And type it in, right? And then wait. And this is all time, time that's tick, tick, ticking away. And it seems ridiculous to go so deep into the judgment of grocery store checkout lines. But you know, imagine instead of 10 checkout lines, it's 10 options for how to market your business. Uh, you're a student, you're writing an essay. 10 options for your opening sentence. Uh, it's a big day at work, uh, someone you want to impress. 10 options for your outfit, right? This is every day. From the biggest problems in our lives to the smallest ones, we use judgment to plan out our actions. And yet, when it goes wrong, when we fail, what do we blame? We blame the work ethic. <laughs> Say, I was lazy, should have worked harder. Or we blame the original idea. I, it wasn't saucy enough, I should have been more creative, I should have come up with more things. But we seldom blame the judgment. We seldom blame this huge process in the middle that lies between ideas and actions. The process of revision, refinery, analysis. Analysis at the Jerusalem artichoke level. Because that's, that's what's behind good judgment. 
And that's, that's the lesson that I learned from the ant story. And I hope that's the one that you remember about it. Not that insects are secretly geniuses, because I don't think we can really uh, say that. It was pretty circumstantial, and I did leave the perfect piece right beside their nest. But rather, you know, it's a reminder that there's a difference between finding an idea and choosing an idea. And that difference is often, I think, the difference between a successful outcome and a mediocre one. We spend so much time as a society talking about the importance of creativity. Can you come up with good ideas, right? Ingenuity, originality, novelty. But we seldom talk about everything that happens after that. Ideas don't come out of us perfect. And even if they do, it isn't always easy to recognize that they're perfect. We seldom talk about judgment, and I think we should. Thanks.